Schultz, uh, who um, got his PhD from uh, Harvard in 1996, is a cultural historian specializing in a broader Iranian world, and his work highlights the wide ranging influence of Iranian civilization on diverse societies stretching from the Balkans to China. Uh, Professor Foltz is the author of over 100 articles and numerous books, which includes Religions of the Silk Road, Pre Modern Patterns of Globalization, Religions of Iran from Prehistory to Present, which um, we have two copies over there on display, and Iran in World History, and most recently, as we know, uh, the book on the history of the Tajiks. Um, joining us um, as discussant tonight um, is Dr. Uh, Dagi Dagiev, who's a research associate in the Department of Academic Research and Publications. He obtained his PhD in the Department of Political Science from University College London, UCL. His PhD thesis was entitled The Process of Transition in Post-Soviet Central Asia and Its Challenges. His research area includes contemporary societies in post-communist Central Asia, their history and religion, the re-emergence of Islam as a faith, the appearance of Islamic ideologies and nationalism. Now, without further ado, um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you very much to uh, uh, dear friend Dagi Dagia for inviting me and for all of you uh, for uh, taking the trouble to join us here uh, this evening. It's um, delightful to see so much interest uh, in a subject which I wasn't sure would generate a lot of interest, um, but it's, 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 it's great that you're here. Uh, obviously, there's quite a lot to say about uh, uh, the history of the Tajiks. Um, I tried to say as much as uh, 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 I could in, in the book, which is, uh, which is available here. Um, so to fit it into a book was quite a challenge. It's even more of a challenge to try to fit it into a, um, a, a, a short lecture. So I'm going to have to really pick and choose and um, uh, maybe just try to um, suggest a couple of, uh, of broad ideas that might, um, might generate some, some discussion later. Uh, the big question really is about identity. What does it mean to be Tajik? What is a Tajik uh, civilization? What is Tajik language? Um, uh, and uh, the short answer, which is in the title of my book, is Iranians of the East. So in a general sense, I don't personally make any distinction between uh, 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 Persian speakers in Tajikistan or Afghanistan or Uzbekistan or Iran or uh, Los Angeles or Toronto. You know, it's the Iranian world. This is Iranian culture. It's the Persian language. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of common ancestry. Uh, amongst these various peoples, but there is also a lot of uh, diverse influences that have entered in in various uh, times and places. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to limit myself to the pre-Islamic period um, just for uh, purposes of uh, economy, because if we get into the Islamic period, it's a whole other story. Um, but when we talk about the formation of what is called Taj Tajik identity, uh, well, it's generally traced to the, 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 the establishment of the Samanid Empire in the 10th century and, and, and onwards, the, the, the birth of New Persian, New Persian uh, uh, um, uh, uh, literary culture, uh, and uh, the, the political model which spread throughout the Muslim world. Of course, this is well known. Um, so what I'm, I'm, I'm maybe going to talk about today is where that comes from. You know, what are the pre-Islamic sources for this Eastern Iranian civilization, which reinvigorated and gave so much life to the broader Islamic civilization and to um, the especially Persian literary culture uh, for, the, for, the, for the last uh, thousand years. So like any identity, uh, what we call Tajik identity is a composite. Uh, there's, no, there, there's no such thing as a pure identity, I think, anywhere in the world. Everybody is, is, is a mix of something. Moreover, these mixes are not static, right? They, uh, even within a, a, an individual person, uh, uh, who, who, how they uh, describe their identity, how they identify themselves, it's circumstantial. In one situation, they might take on a certain identity, and in a different situation, they might shift that identity somewhat. It's still the same person, right? So, but everybody's multi-layered. 
And in the same way that individuals are multi-layered in terms of their identities, uh, entire societies are multi-layered in terms of their identities. So when you say Tajik, you're saying at once something very general, but you're also sometimes suggesting something that is maybe a particular layer of an identity which actually has more to it. You could be Tajik and something else, in the same way you can be Iranian and something else, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit complicated uh, to, uh, to, to unpack that. But I just want to sort of offer that as a caveat to begin with, that I'm not here to offer any hard and fast and clear definitions of what it means to be a Tajik or what Tajik civilization is. I'll talk about some of the historical and prehistorical components which fed into this development, an ongoing dynamic uh, development of, 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 of identity that we associate with the word Tajik. So in a very general sense, I would say that Tajik identity is formed in three major phases. There are three major stages uh, that, 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 that give rise to what we perceive as Tajik identity today. Um, there is the uh, very ancient phase, which is a blend uh, of two very different kinds of peoples, an encounter and a mixing of two sociologically, anthropologically, ethnically very different kinds of peoples that came to interact and live together in Central Asia um, from about 4,000 to 3,000 years ago. That is to say, during the second millennium BC. I'm going to focus a bit on that. Um, uh, and then um, uh, uh, over time, within 2,000 years or so, um, a particular group of uh, people uh, emerged out of that interaction between uh, steppe nomads uh, and uh, settled agricultural industrial peoples, right? These two very different kinds of peoples that, that found each other in Central Asia. And within that broader encounter, which of course spread beyond Central Asia, the, the what uh, is sometimes called the, the cultures of the steppe and the cultures of the sown, in other words, the nomadic peoples and the sedentary peoples, right? That plays itself out as a dynamic in many different parts of the world. And even in Central Asia, it's fairly, fairly complex. But in a general sense, we can say that by about 2,000 years ago, one group emerged out of that synthesis that are known to us as the Sogdians. And the Sogdians left us a very great and rich cultural legacy um, and were the predominant culture, the predominant civilization in Central Asia prior to the coming of Islam, the, 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 the conquest of, of, of the Muslims uh, during the early 8th century uh, and the eventual Islamization of the region, okay? So in that sense, I consider the Sogdians to be the direct ancestors of the Tajiks. So then the second stage of development uh, would be the Sogdian period and Sogdian civilization. And then the third would be this new Islamic culture, which comes out of uh, a, a, an encounter, again, a mix of different peoples, uh, the Sogdian peoples of Central Asia and the Muslims, uh, who came from further west and brought this Islamic culture in which the Sogdians, in, in, in fact, turned out to play a huge role in developing. Okay? And then we have uh, the emergence of this word Tajik, right? which I'm not going to talk about too much today because that's a whole different lecture. I gave it last night, and I'll give it again on Monday. <laughs> Tonight, I think I'll just talk about the pre-Islamic period, and I hope that that's not too disappointing for anybody. So let's start with this first phase, this very uh, ancient prehistoric period, which is very, very difficult to know about with any certainty. Our major source is archaeology, of course, but archaeology is a difficult um, science to work with because we, are, we dig up objects in the ground. We don't know how representative they are of the cultures that produced them. And we don't necessarily know what they mean or how they were used. We can guess, right? But uh, if you just were to, were, were, to, were, were to imagine that after the coming uh, uh, apocalypse that totally obliterates Western civilization of the 21st century, let's say a thousand years from now, 
some future archaeologists are digging up where we are now in the rubble, what remains of what was once called London, and they, they find uh, uh, an object which is a man nailed to a cross, right, looking really miserable, and maybe they find some beaten up metal cup, right? And imagine trying to reconstruct everything that we know about 21st century British society based on these two objects. If you didn't know anything else, you might think, okay, this was a society that practiced human sacrifice. You know, they used to capture their enemies and nail them to crosses, and then they would, they would maybe pour the blood into this cup and they drink it in their rituals. That was their religion. So they were a warlike society. Think of the, the, the conclusions that you might draw about 21st century Britain and how wrong you would be. So this is the problem when we're dealing with archaeology, right? So we have actually a very rich archaeological legacy in Central Asia, but we really can't be that confident that we always are applying the correct interpretations. We make our best guesses. We can combine uh, 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 this archaeological information with a couple of other things. We can look at historical linguistics, and related to historical linguistics is comparative mythology. So we have myths that are preserved in different languages by different peoples, which claim to be preserving stories from prehistoric times, ancient times. So of course, for Iranians, this is certainly the most famous is the Shahnameh, the Book of Kings, right? Because the Shahnameh ends with the Islamic conquest. So if you want to know about pre-Islamic Iran, one of the best sources you have is the Shahnameh, of course. Uh, there's a lot of information in there and can suggest a lot uh, that can help us understand you know, pre-Islamic Iranian culture. However, we should recall that Ferdowsi was a Muslim, and he lived in the 11th century. And he's writing about people who were as far away from him, both in time and in terms of culture, than he is from us. Right? So for us, if we imagine living in Ferdowsi's time, well, it's a very different world. It's exotic for us. And we might not really understand what it was like. In the same way, Ferdowsi, if he writes about Rostam, you know, a great Saka warrior from a thousand years before, two thousand years before, Ferdowsi is an urban, educated, literate man. You know, he's used to living in a comfortable house and drinking good wine and eating good food and having servants and things like that. He's not used to galloping about on the steps, you know, fighting battles. So for him, Rostam and the Saka stories are very, very exotic. And so we have to be careful how we interpret that as historical information. We can compare with other epics. We can compare, for example, with the Ossetian epics of the Caucasus, which are, you know, very closely related. Ossetian is a, is a northeastern Iranian language. It's close to, to Sogdian. It's close to uh, the Avestan language. We can look at the Avesta, religious text. But the Avesta is problematic as well, because it's in an Iranian language that doesn't exist in any other form. So we can't compare it with anything, except perhaps Vedic Sanskrit, which is a little bit like trying to understand that there were only one Portuguese book in the entire world, <coughs> and you, you, you try to use your knowledge of Spanish to figure out this Portuguese book. You'd probably make a lot of mistakes. And scholars who use Vedic Sanskrit to understand the Avesta, they make a lot of mistakes because it's not the same language, right? So again, the Avesta is a source for understanding this ancient world, but it's problematic. So what we can do in order to make our best guesses is combine them, okay? We dig up something out of the ground, we say, hmm, what was this? What did this mean? And if we can associate it with something that we've heard about or read about from the myths, or if we can... Uh, associate with something that a term that we've discovered from historical linguistics. We study a bunch of different languages and we compare them and we say, hmm, it seems that 4,000 years ago there was a word, let's say, for example, the word Arya. Arya, which is a, uh, uh, well, we have no documents from that period that use that word, but historical linguistics, which analyzes the trans uh, transformations of languages and shows how they change over time can project backwards and by comparing, for example, different Indo-European languages, they hypothesize that very likely 4,000 years ago there were people living in the southern Ural Mountain region, what's now western Siberia, 
who called themselves Aryo. Okay, they might not have pronounced it exactly like that, but you know, something like Aryo. And uh, so we get that through historical linguistics, uh, but it's reinforced through comparative mythology because the word comes up in the Avesta, it comes up in the, the, the Vedas, and it comes up in a lot of other uh, uh, um, uh, literary material, you know, as aria. Okay, of course, unfortunately, the, the Germans appropriated it in the 20th century and turned it into a racist <laughs> genocidal term. So it's been kind of contaminated by that. But if we put the, 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 the Nazis aside, this word has a very ancient pedigree, and it was a name, it was a group name. People applied to themselves. They called themselves Arya. And we have figured from this kind of methodology I've been describing that the word probably meant we, the noble people, the noble ones, right? And we, we, we know that they called their homeland Aryanambayaja, which means uh, the land of the noble ones. So they called their, their, their homeland Aryanavayaja, and words change pronunci pronunci pronunciation over time. Within a couple thousand years, it was being pronounced Eiran Vej, and today it's pronounced Iran. Okay, so Iran literally means the land of the noble people. The noble people being what you know, we call ourselves. So Aryan, when we use the word Aryan today, that's the correct meaning. That's the correct meaning. Now, why do I localize? Why do I begin at Sintashta 4,000 years ago? Because any historical discussion has to start off with an arbitrary point. Okay, so this is arbitrary. I'm just picking for my own convenience. I'm picking 4,000 years ago Southern Ural Mountains. Why? Because that's where we have enough material come together from archaeology and from comparative mythology and historical linguistics that we can make an, a case, we can make an argument that there was a people living there that have left us enough information that we can know something about who they were, what kind of people they were, what kind of society they had. So if we compare stories from the Rig Veda and from the Avesta, for example, we know that there's enough in common that these stories must have originated at a time before the Vedic peoples and Avestan peoples separated. Okay, and they separated during the third or second millennium BCE, around 3,500 years ago, over a period of centuries. So they're, they're, these stories must come from a time before that, so at least 4,000 years ago. Okay, some of these, these stories that are in common. And some of the words and some of the religious uh, notions as well, the kinds of sacrifice. So, for example, we know that they practiced horse sacrifice. They were a horse-based culture. They were nomads. They were warrior nomads. They were mounted archers. And in fact, when we uh, 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 jump ahead to the Sogdians, uh, Sogda probably comes from, the, the, the word Sogda probably comes from the Indo-European verb skuda, which means to shoot. Okay, And the English word shoot also comes from the same Indo-European root. So the shooters. The, 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 the same root gives us in Greek, Scythian. The Scythians were exact. They were the Iranian-speaking nomadic archers from Central Asia that encountered the Greeks. And the Greeks had a lot of contact with the Scythians, right? But Scythian means mounted archer. And probably Sogdian comes from the same uh, etymology. This is what these people were known for. You know, they pastured flocks, mainly cows. The cow was their most important animal and source of wealth. It's interesting that in modern Uzbek, anybody here speak Uzbek, Jeff? So the word for uh, cow is mal, property. If you know Arabic, you know it's an Arabic word. Mal means property, right? So the word for cow is the word for property in Uzbek. That says something. That in, yeah, that it's a preservation in a Central Asian culture, this notion that the essential property is cows. The, the, so the... the, the uh, the, uh, the, and and, and this, this, is, this is characteristic of this Aryan culture. Um, uh, that we, we call them the Sintashta culture for arbitrary reasons because there are a lot of archaeological finds from a region of uh, a part of western Siberia um, near a river called Sintashta. It's a very small river. Um, and so that the archaeologists, the Soviet archaeologists, they just gave that name to the culture. So we call it the Sintashta culture. Okay, but when we say Sintashta culture, we're talking about 
an Aryan culture, the, a, a culture that called themselves the Aryans. They spoke Proto-Iranian. They spoke an early Iranian language. They practiced an early form of Iranian religion. They were pastoral nomads. They lived off of pasturing flocks, <laughs> mainly cattle. Um, and they made a living also by, they supplemented their income by raiding each other and stealing other people's cattle. So they were warriors. And the great epics that we have, like the Shahnameh, uh, but also like the Mahabharata, and also like the Nibelungen Light, the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Icelandic sagas, they all come from the same origin. This culture where the greatest, most respected figure in society was the warrior hero. And, and yet, the wealthiest person in society was the poet who composed songs to honor this hero. This is the interesting thing. So you have the poet and the hero. I was visiting Ossetia in the Caucasus uh, uh, last year, and in this mountain valley, which has a holy shrine uh, of the Ossetians, which goes back to Scythian uh, religion, on the one side of this big boulder, there was an image of Kosta Ketagurov, who is the Ossetian national poet. On the other side is Joseph Stalin. Why? Well, you know, I thought, that's weird. And my host said, no, it's perfectly normal. You should expect that. You're a scholar. You know the poet and the hero. Because for the Ossetians, Stalin is a hero. I bet you didn't know Stalin was Ossetian. You thought he was Georgian, right? He was an Osset from Georgia. So the Ossetians today, they're proud of him. And by the way, they're convinced that that stuff about the purges, that, that he had nothing to do with that. In fact, he was the one who stopped the purges as soon as he found out about it. You know. So there's a whole rehabilitation of Stalin going on. Because they need a hero. <laughs> the poet and the hero. So that goes back to this ancient Aryan culture. It's characteristic of the Aryan culture. And this, that's why we have this very rich oral literature. We have the Narts, we have the Shahnameh from this period, reflecting this culture of warriors fighting each other, mostly for cattle. Of course, they were dependent on horses, because horses is what gave them the advantage over their enemies. Also, metallurgy, because they had uh, access to copper mines in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the Urals, and, uh, and, and uh, also tin, and they were able to forge better, stronger weapons. They also <laughs> invented the wheeled chariot. And it's not surprising that in the mythologies of these peoples, that the wheeled chariot, the warrior chariot, plays a huge role. So, um, uh, very often the peoples of the steppes are referred to as Korgan peoples. Korgan is a Turkish word, um, but it refers to, in this case, burial mounds. And you find them from Bulgaria all the way to Mongolia. And they've been left by these Aryan peoples. Because this is their richest legacy. Okay, They didn't build cities, they, they didn't build roads, they didn't build infrastructure. But they, were, they, 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 they devoted a lot of resources to, uh, 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 to burials. Okay? So important people would get these elaborate burials, they'd be underground chambers, and then you know, they would be buried with, with their slaves, with their women, with their jewels, with their weapons, and often with their horses and chariots. So a lot of what we know about this culture is through these burials, these so-called Korgan uh, burials, which you can still see all over the place, and they're excavating them all the time. Okay, um, and um, uh, what's interesting is that we have burials from Sintashta from four thousand years ago, which have horses and chariots, and the, in in the Rig Veda, which gets written down in India about the eighth century BCE, so much later, more than a thousand years later, because some of these Aryans have migrated to India. And so the oldest Sanskrit text is the Rig Veda. It was written down uh, 2,800 years or so ago, but what was written down was not new. It was oral tradition that had been around for a long time before that. So the Rig Veda seems to be the oldest text preserving this ancient culture, which came from outside of India. And a lot of Indian nationalists really don't like to hear that, but this is what the, the evidence says overwhelmingly. So the Rig Veda is actually one of our best sources for understanding the culture of the Sintashta Aryans, right? these ancestors to the Tajiks. The Rig Veda is, is, is a very useful thing. And one example of how it's useful, um, uh, uh, the Vedic religion had a very important ritual called Asvamedha, which is a horse sacrifice. As is, uh, of course, horse, as you'll recognize. 
The horse sacrifice was perhaps the most expensive and elaborate ritual reserved for the very most rich and powerful individuals, okay? Because a horse is really valuable. You don't sacrifice a horse unless you really have to because it's worth a lot more alive than dead. So the horse sacrifice was a big deal. And it's very elaborate. And the Rig Veda spells out in great detail exactly step by step how you should do it, right? Um, and, uh, uh, well, interestingly, they've dug up horse burials in Sintashta in Western Siberia that seem to have followed that prescription, right? So apparently this material in the Vedas from India dates back to a time when the Aryans were living in Western Siberia and practicing this kind of <laughs> sacrifice. So that's an example of how we can sort of draw on different materials and try to form a picture of um, what kind of peoples these were. Okay, that is um, uh, a, uh, uh, an overhead view of the remains of one of the Sintashta settlements. This is called Archaim, uh, and uh, this has been one of the richest. So they, they tended to be round settlements. They had about 50 houses in them. Um, every home had a forge. So all of, these, all of these people were forging their own weapons. Right? Um, and again, uh, if you know much about pastoral nomadic societies, Pastoral nomadism is a very kind of iffy way to live. You know, you can have a bad season and lose all your livestock, and it's really, you're always kind of at the edge of survival. So almost all pastoral nomadic societies in the world, historically, have had to live off of raiding, whether we're talking about the Arabs or whether we're talking about the Turks or, uh, you know, the uh, Aborigines in Australia. Um, they have to raid because, you know, they won't survive otherwise. Okay, so that's where you know, the, the, the hero warrior element comes in. So this is what, this is what the, this is Ariana Mayacha. This is, this is what the original Iran looked like. Uh, and there's, a, you get a, a, a that's, a, I guess, infrared photography to show what's actually still buried that they haven't excavated yet, so you can get a sense of the, of the town plan. Here's a, somebody's, uh, an artist's uh, reconception of how it might have been. Now, the, the, the Soviets were really into um, uh, digging up skulls and then having sculptors sort of, you know, redo that. They did Tamerlane, for example. You've probably seen pictures of that. Um, Gerasimov was the, was, the, was the guy who, was, who, was, uh, uh, who started this technique. And th 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 these are a couple of um, uh, individuals that were dug up from Sintashta. So uh, here we have a Soviet sculptor's rendition of what a couple of these ancient Aryans um, presumably looked like. And here we have a modern artist's idea. Um, interestingly, there are video games now that, <laughs> that have Sintashta, so you can actually go back and, 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 you know, and take on the role of one of these people. You get the idea of the wheeled chariot. Uh, any of you see the Scythians exhibit uh, at the British Museum last year? That was quite good. Um, Hazarin. This is from a later period. The, the, the material they showed at that exhibition was from the mid-first millennium BCE. But it was a direct inheritance from the peoples we're talking about because they moved east and then they moved south. Okay, so here you have uh, one of the, the burials and you can see the chariot wheels up there, you know, see the way, and maybe some horse bones. <coughs> <clears throat> there you go, another, and see the horses, and then the chariot, chariot wheel. And by the way, this is reflected in their rock art. Uh, one of the things that these people did was they left us a lot of rock art, which I'll show you some examples of. Um, most of it, we assume, was religious in nature. So here we have uh, Sintashta here. Of course, they came from somewhere. You know, there is a prehistory to the Sintashtans, like everybody else, but we are not talking about that. They came from further, further west, probably what's now Ukraine, southern Russia, um, uh, this area here. But some of them moved here, okay, to the southern Europe. So we have Sintashta, 2100 to 1800 BC, period of, you know, three, four hundred years, characteristic of this. And then they started to move east. So later on, in later centuries, they're known as the Andronova culture. You see, they went as far as Mongolia. And it's interesting, during the first millennium BCE, for more than a thousand years, all of Eurasia, Iranian was the dominant language, from Bulgaria to China. It was an Iranian linguistic and cultural territory, and that's, that's really quite something, um, for, for a good thousand years or more. Okay, so we, 
We have them here, we have them going into the Turin Basin, we have the desert mummies here, which are presumably uh, related people uh, called Toparians. They were Indo-European speakers who seem to have headed east before the Iranians did. And then the Iranians, you know, they were less warlike, and the Iranians successively subdued them. Okay? And then we have them starting to move south. Now, this is the second component, the other culture. Remember I talked about this mix of two very different societies, a pastoral nomadic warrior society, and then a sedentary agricultural and industrial society, right? So now we're going to talk about the second. BMAC means Bactriana Margiana Archaeological Complex, which is a bit of a mouthful. But this is what archaeologists have called it, because in the former Greek or Seleucid provinces of Bactria, uh, which is now Afghanistan, and Margiana, what's now Turkmenistan, um, uh, we have a cultural ensemble. We have, uh, dating to around the same period as the Sintash to people further north, we have a cultural ensemble uh, of buildings, of technologies, of factories, uh, and to some extent, uh, notions of religious behavior and social hierarchies and so forth, but no language. We have no idea what language these people spoke. Okay? They have a lot in common with the Elamites and a lot in common with the Indus Valley civilization. To this day, it's not clear whether the Elamites and the Indus Valley people were related or not because we, you know, we haven't deciphered the Indus Valley language yet. They had writing, but we don't know what it says. The BMAC people may have had writing. There are some things that may be writing, but they haven't been deciphered. Um, but linguists who study, for example, Iranian languages and uh, Indic languages, they have filtered out a number of words that appear, for example, in Sogdian by about 2,000 years ago or, or, or longer that are not Iranian and that therefore are assumed to have been borrowings from the neighboring people. Since the neighboring people were the BMAC, we assume that these words came from the BMAC language. So if you know Persian, you might be surprised to know that some of these words include shotor, camel, uh, ajur, brick, gandom, wheat. Well, guess what? The Aryans didn't have camels, they didn't build with bricks, and they didn't plant wheat. But the BMAC people did. So there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that would lead you to conclude that these words entered uh, Iranian language through the encounter of the Aryans and the BMAC peoples, who are sometimes called the Oxus peoples. That's a little easier to say, the Oxus civilization. We know them from the, especially from the great uh, treasure hoards of gold jewelry and such, uh, much of which exists in the British Museum and the DNA. Um, uh, so the, the, the Oxus civilization, BMAC, it's the same thing, okay? So again, they were related, or they were very closely connected. We know they traded with the Elamites and with the Indus Valley peoples. We don't know if they just traded with them or if they were actually related to each other because we don't know the languages, or we know Elamite, but we don't know the others, okay? So that's an open question. But for example, we know that the BMAC that, that, that their major goddess, that, that their major deity was a goddess. And this goddess, in every way that she's represented, seems to be very, very similar to Ishtar, the Mesopotamian goddess that is so famous, right? Um, and this seems to be a function of the connections between BMAC and Mesopotamia, okay? And later on, the Iranians, uh, who had a very important water goddess, uh, who later came to be known as Anahita. Anahita absorbs many of these features, right? And actually gets sort of uh, rebranded in Central Asia in the Sasanian period as Anahita. So Anahita becomes very popular in Bactria and in Sogdiana, right? Where the goddess was presumably already very popular, but, you know, just got got rebranded as an Iranian goddess. Okay, so again, an example of how these cultures are, are, um, are interacting and combining to make uh, uh, some, some, uh, something new. Okay, okay. <clears throat> I, I mentioned rock art. 
Um, these peoples left, they didn't leave any writing, but they left rock art all over the place. And of course, it's not that easy to decipher, but a lot of them are hunting scenes, reflecting the fact that they, you know, like to hunt. Um, a lot of them are ceremonial scenes, and some of them we can figure out probably what they meant, and some we don't. There's a lot of uh, indication of solar deities. We know that the Aryans worship the sun, and in fact, Herodotus says of the Scythians that they worship primarily the sun. Um, uh, but the same is true of the Sakas in, uh, in Khotan before they became Buddhist, and in, in Zoroastrianism, of course, uh, uh, you know, Ahura Mazda and Mitra are both associated with the sun. Um, uh, uh, the Yazidis uh, in Iraq, they pray to the sun first thing every morning. So this is a typically Aryan thing to worship, uh, to worship the sun. So you see that a lot in their rock art. You see some uh, sexual acts. We're not quite sure what that's about. We don't know if, this is, if it is reflecting some kind of fertility rituals or if it is raping your enemies to, to show that you've subdued them. We don't really know how to interpret these things, right? Um, we have dances, um, and, uh, they, they, and, 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 and these are set usually in groves that very likely were sites that were used for religious ceremonies. So you do a religious ceremony before you go out hunting, for example, in order to ensure that the gods will give you a successful hunt, right? So, you know, that, that's one way of interpreting all these animal things and the dances and sometimes dressing up as animals. We see people with animal heads and so on and so forth. Anyway, um, a couple of places that I personally have visited that have very, very rich uh, troves of this rock art. One is in southern Kazakhstan, what's, uh, just north of the so-called Seven Rivers region, half Drud or Semirechia or Jetisu, depending on the language, um, which is the area roughly between Bishkek and Almaty, they in um, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, way up in the steppe north of that, about a uh, you know, three, four hour drive north of that, you've got in the middle of the steppe, you've got this kind of grove, and it has a lot of these scenes. So probably it was a ritual site. There's another in the Pamir Mountains in the Wahan Corridor, right on the border, the Panj River, the border between Afghanistan and Tajikistan. And again, you can see up there um, a, a lot of these things. And there are other sites as well, in the Issyk Kol, in the north of the, the Issyk Kol, and in Uzbekistan, but uh, I'll just show you some of the scenes. Uh, so here's Tamgali, here's what it looks like. Um, the archaeologists refer to this as Tamgali Gorge, but it's not really a gorge, is it? It's more of a sort of belt. But the, 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 all these rocks here have, have, have engravings on them. And this, this area here may have, been, this, uh, may have been where they performed their rituals. <clears throat> okay, here you have a, um, uh, a ground view of it. Okay, so here we have a chariot. Okay, and we, we assume that the chariots had a sacred function. They helped you win battles, and they were buried with people, you know, so the chariot goes into the afterlife with the hero. So the chariot, you know, has, has, has a religious uh, function. If you know Greek mythology, of course, Apollo goes, you know, across the sky in the chariot, because the Greeks, you know, came from the same ancestry. This, does anybody recognize it? This is a phaedra. And a phaedra is the leading candidate uh, for um, what may have been the major consistent of halma, this intoxicating beverage that the ancient Iranians used to use in their ceremonies, this hallucinogenic beverage. Um, uh, its chemical properties are similar to that in ecstasy, um, and uh, it, was, it was quite popular. Um, it got sublimated in Zoroastrianism and in Hinduism. They don't use the same substance anymore for the rituals. Um, but um, the, that's, that's where it comes from. So here you see some, uh, some uh, uh, hunting scenes. Very often you have, you have the hunters and their dogs that are helping out and helping attack the animals and so forth. <clears throat> and here you have a dance. And you know, I wonder if this is a halma dance. Maybe they, you know, uh, recite their prayers and, and drink their halma, and then they start dancing around in a circle. I mean, it's all hypothetical. We don't know these things, you know, but we, we can just guess. Clearly, this seems to be some kind of religious ceremony connected with the hunt. Okay, again, we have dancing figures. Um, here we have what appear to be two priests, because they, they look like they're praying. They also have huge erections. 
So, you know, not quite sure how to interpret that. Again, is it a fertility ritual? Are they excited because they're about to go into battle? I mean, we really don't know how to interpret this kind of thing, right? But it's intriguing. Here we have anal sex. Again, we don't know what this means. We don't know if it's male to female because, or, or male to male because we can't make out the faces or you know, anatomy enough, right? And we don't know if this is related to fertility. We don't know if it's pornography. Um, we don't know if it's, it's representing <clears throat> subjugating the enemy, right? It's open to interpretation. Unless we get some other source that can shed some light on it. Now, what's this? We have this figure that seems to have the sun on his head. <laughs> So um, this is, uh, you know, um, uh, clearly not a not, not a human figure unless it's a, a priest wearing like a, a sun helmet, um, and we don't know if this is just an attendant. You know, again, you can look at some religious texts, perhaps from the Avesta, and you can look at texts about Mitra, and you can say, oh, well, maybe it's illustrating this, you know, and you might be right, but. You know, bear in mind what I said about the cross and the chalice. I mean, we can guess, but we don't really know. By the way, these things predate Zoroastrianism. These, these images have been carbon dated to around 1300 BCE. And I, I suspect the Zoroaster's time is probably around 1200 to 1000 BCE. So slightly after that, but very close. So when we think about Zoroaster and the rise of Zoroastrianism, I would place him in this society. Okay, so whatever we can say about these people, about these Aryans, um, these Bronze Age peoples, I think that's the society that Zoroaster was born into, right? So whatever we see in the Gathas, I think this is what he is responding to, what he's commenting on. So this is, in my opinion, helpful for understanding the origins of Zoroastrianism. I also believe that Mitra was probably the predominant deity for these people prior to Zoroastrianism. It makes a lot of sense. He's the god of the spoken contract. He's the god of the warriors. Uh, if you lie, he's got a thousand eyes, and he will see you. He knows what you're up to, and he will punish you, right? Um, and uh, uh, it's a, it, he's an all-male god, and, he's the, so, and, and this we see in the Roman army, and we see survivals of it today, you know, in Freemasonry and all these you know, kinds of secret societies of fraternities. We see it with the mafia. Right? Very often have their meetings underground, and very often their rituals are centered around a bull sacrifice or a sublimation of the bull sacrifice. So I think that in this sense, there are Mitraic traditions that are very, very ancient, and that probably, at least for the warrior caste, Mitra was the was the was the predominant deity that was then sort of co-opted into Zoroastrianism at a later time. Okay, this is another strange image that appears to be of some kind of deity. <clears throat> Here we have, again, a chariot wheel, but this kind of symbol uh, appears in a, lot of, um, uh, in a lot of religious art as well. So again, you know, the chariot is religious. Here you get another hunting scene. The dog is helping. I don't know what that is. I really don't. This is from Langar, who's teaching this stuff. I really, um, but I'm not, it's not my field. I'm not an art historian, but I would be delighted if somebody could shed any light on what they, you know, what this <coughs> might be. This is Saraz, uh, uh, one of the most ancient sites in Tajikistan. It's a, uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's just on the Uzbek border, uh, west of Tajikistan. <laughs> so it's going, yeah, you've been there. Yeah, it's, it's going back. Yeah, so this is a very, very important site. Um, this is Gunnar Tepe in uh, Turkmenistan. Again, it may or may not have been an Aryan site. Some, you know, the, the guy who discovered it thinks that it's er an early Zoroastrian site, uh, Victor Syrianidi, he was a Greek Soviet archeologist. I don't think so. Um, uh, I don't think that, I could, that we can place Zoroastrianism there at that time. But, you know, it's all theories. You don't know. Um, this is uh, some examples of BMAC art goddess, one of the goddess figures, and then some of the Oxus treasure that some of you may have seen in some of the museums here. So they were, yeah, the, the, the Scythians and you know, the, the Sakas were quite well known for their gold work, especially uh, animal motifs and so forth. Okay, this is something very interesting. You see these black and white lines? 
This is a site near, just north of Tashkorgan in the Tajik Autonomous County um, of uh, Xinjiang province in western China. Uh, it's very hard to get to, especially now, because the Chinese government has turned it into a police state and you can't go 100 meters without being stopped by the police and photographed and interrogated. And then 100 meters further on, they'll do it again. Um, I think I had my photograph taken probably 26 times a day um, when I was there by the, by the police. It's just terrible. But um, <clears throat> I was there with a Chinese archaeologist who had done a lot of computer calculations using it, the plotting the directions of these lines. And he discovered that these lines are indicating all the major um, solar events of the year. So this is a calendar. This is a calendar. And, it, and it's dated to around the 5th century BC. So it's a 2,500 year old calendar. Um, I suggested calling it the Saka Stonehenge. Presumably, at that time, the people who, who lived here were Sakas. Right? And so I, I, I assume that this is a product of their astronomy and probably used for um, religious purposes. Here you can see it a little more closely. Here you can see what it looks like on the ground. Um, there's the Tashkorgan Fortress. Um, uh, of course, it's been renovated quite a lot, but it has been there. It has been a major uh, stopping point on the Silk Road for, for more than 2,000 years. Uh, Tashkorgan, of course, in Turkish means stone tower. There are stone towers all over Central Asia, and there are places called Tashkorgan all over Central Asia. But this is probably the most famous one. And there's another view of the tower from the side. Um, this is a similar fortress. This is Yangchun Fortress in the Wahan Valley. That's the Panj River in the background, and those mountains are in Afghanistan. Uh, this again, uh, it's been renovated uh, time and again, but it probably its foundations date back at least 2,000 years. If you want to get to the Wahan Corridor today, you have to be willing to invest a lot of time and you have to have very good bones because it's a very bumpy road and you have to be on it for a couple of days. You have to really want to get there. It's not easy. And then the other side, um, the Chinese have sealed it off and you can't go anywhere. The Pakistanis have sealed it off. You can't go anywhere. So you have to turn back. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty inaccessible. Um, so when you're there and have spent a couple days suffering to get there, it's quite amazing to think that this was like the major highway, uh, the, the major trans-Asian highway uh, for many, many centuries, uh, what we call the Silk Road, right? And this was the major uh, route by which Buddhism was transmitted from uh, Gandhara, from what's now Pakistan, uh, uh, through Afghanistan and into China, right? So Buddhism passed through here. There's a lot of Buddhist temples and Buddhist remains here uh, because it was a highway. This is how you got from India to China. Um, and it may be, again, you know, this Belt and Road Initiative uh, decides to open up the Bafan Corridor. Um, yeah, some more scenes of that. Yeah, so we have more... Uh, Saka gold work, uh, war chariots. Um, this is Panjakent, uh, which is famous for what? Sogdian paintings. The Sogdians were great merchants. They made a lot of money. Businessmen who make a lot of money like to show off by building big houses and furnishing them as elaborately as possible so that they can impress their guests, especially if their guests are business partners from foreign countries. Right, so the Sogdians had business partners visiting from India, from China, from Iran, from Byzantium. Right? Sogdiana was really the center of the world. This was the height of the Silk Road, and the Sogdians were the masters of the Silk Road. We have Sogdian colonies from the Black Sea on the Crimea. There was a town called Sogdaya, Sogdian colony in what's now, well, Ukraine or Russia, depending on whose side you're on, of the Crimea, all the way to China. Uh, the capitals, Xi'an and Luoyang, had large Sogdian quarters. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the Sogdians were the major transmitters of religions to China. So that there's uh, Sogdians who transmitted uh, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism. This is the biggest Buddha in Central Asia. He was found in southern Tajikistan. It's now in the Museum of Dushanbe. It is 18 meters long. 
It's in the book. It's long. <laughs> it's a big Buddha. Um, it's the largest reclining Buddha, I think, in, 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 in Asia. It's, it's, anyway, and it's in Tajikistan. Um, so southern Tajikistan was largely Buddhist, as was Bactria, what's now Afghanistan, before the Islamic period. And this is a, from a Buddhist temple at Bunjikat, up, up near Khojand, in the north of Tajikistan. Um, it's burned because when the Arabs came, they burned all the, <laughs> all the Buddhist temples, and this is what survived from one of them. Okay, here's a scene of Panjakent, uh, uh, what remains from some of the houses. The paintings have all been carted off to St. Petersburg. They're all in the Hermitage. Right? I think it would be nice if the Russians would give the Tajiks these paintings back, but so far they haven't shown any inclination to do so. So if you want, And they're not on display either. If you want to see the paintings, you gotta, you gotta months in advance. You gotta write letters to the, you know, museum authorities in, in Russia, and just I've never seen them. Uh, it's really difficult. They have a few paintings in Tajikistan, though, very, very few. And even here at Panjikamp, there's a very small museum with a couple of paintings. Um, here are some examples of uh, Sogdian paintings. So these were paintings that rich businessmen would have commissioned to paint on their walls. And they're representing all different kinds of scenes. They're representing myths and stories, religions, gods. They're representing things from China. They're representing things from, uh, uh, from India. Uh, this is presumably the goddess Anahita, or Nanai, uh, 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 which is a local pronunciation of the Mesopotamian goddess Inanna, who was, again, the most popular goddess in Sogdiana. Um, and what's that? Hang on, Romulus and Remus, right, suckling at the she-wolf. So these people were in touch with Rome as well, right? And, and so these rich businessmen, they wanted to really show off their cosmopolitan character. You know, they wanted to show, yeah, yeah, we do business with Rome, yeah, we do business with China, we do business with India. And this is reflected in the art. <clears throat> um, as are you know, traditional noble themes about the heroes fighting in their war chariots and um, so on and so forth. These are from Athosya, which is outside of Samarkand, so-called Hall of the Ambassadors. So one of the great legacies of the Sogdians, of course, is their art. And it's interesting. We know that Iranians, early on, developed a very sophisticated artistic tradition. And in Iran, what happened was that you know, the Arabs came along, and initially they were very influenced by Byzantine iconoclasm, and they forbade representational art. So artists tended to go into non-representational forms of art, calligraphy and things like that. But in Central Asia, you have this preservation. And I assume that what we have preserved in Sogdiana is a more widespread ancient Iranian tradition. For example, uh, Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, he lived in the third century in Mesopotamia. He was most famous originally as a painter. And he was, and he was known throughout history, throughout the Islamic period, as the greatest painter who ever lived. Now, none of his paintings have survived. But if he was that great a painter, and if he was an exponent of what Iranian painting was in the third century, then I assume that to some extent that tradition survives in Sogdiana two, three centuries later, and then comes to life again after the Mongols start to give their patronage in the 13th century and start paying Iranian artists to start doing representational art again. You get these illustrated shamames and so forth. So I suspect that this Sogdian painting is kind of the missing link between the, 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 the ancient Iranian tradition that perhaps Mani represented and the very, very rich uh, tradition of Persian painting that we get in the Timurid period, the Safavid period, and so forth. Okay. And this is a contemporary artist's reconstruction of what this Hall of Ambassadors uh, would, have, would have looked like um, before <laughs> the poor time that it's uh, the, the number. So as, uh, as, as promised, um, I'm, conclu I'm concluding with the Sogdians, um, but I'm happy to talk about anything Tajik related, anything related to the, the book spans from Sintashta up to the present day, uh, you know, the Republic of Tajikistan and the, the fate of Tajiks in Uzbekistan and Afghanistan and China and in the diaspora. The one million or more Tajiks who are working in Russia and sending their money home, 
keeping the economy afloat. Happy to talk about any of these things for you know, as much time as we can. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Very engaging, very, very interesting talk. Uh, welcome you once again, and uh, thank you on this very sort of symbolic uh, lecture room. Uh, but also, I would like to thank you on behalf of myself as a Tajik and uh, and the rest of Tajiks all over the world, uh, because I will just say a few words uh, actually before before probably we go to the questions. Uh, like almost two decades ago, when I came uh, to this country. The thing is, not many people knew about Tajiks, and uh, whenever they ask, I have to sort of describe, and then sometimes going into details and, and telling a little bit about geography and, uh, and, and the people who they are. And uh, I always was, uh, personally, and I know many other uh, uh, Tajik uh, <coughs> patriots and uh, friends, wanted some, to see something like uh, what the professor has done uh, about Tajiks in, in like English language, uh, because it's a big uh, and uh, quite important introduction for us. But briefly also, I would like to say a few words about uh, identity and uh, history and culture of Tajik people. Not me, but I just want to sort of raise some awareness and uh, at the same time probably professor can help us. Uh, one of the thing about sort of Tajiks, uh, present sort of we always look at Tajikistan and s sort of seeing some kind of uh, Tajik centuries, that this is Tajikistan and these are Tajiks. But when we are talking about uh, sort of this history and culture behind, it's uh, probably better known as a greater Khorasan, which, uh, which covers what is now uh, a region called Khorasan in present modern Iran. And the whole of Central Asia, I would say, uh, like sort of southern uh, Kazakhstan and uh, what is in China now, we have western part of China, Afghanistan, and uh, some bits of western Pakistan, including northern area of Pakistan. This is like mainly the land where we can probably sort of geographically <coughs> locate Tajiks or modern Tajiks. And uh, since Ferdowsi is Shahnama. We almost like for thousand years we don't have a specific book written about Tajik sort of presenting or, or sort of as a reference point to the Tajik history. And only in the modern time, in the 20th century, we have like a contribution of a great scholar such as Vasily Bartol, who is known as a as a great scholar of Central Asia in general, but specific references to sort of the Tajik or Iranian people of, of uh, modern Central Asia. And then later on, in by the sort of like the middle of Soviet time, before the end of the Soviet time, we have Obojan Rapuru, another renowned Tajik uh, historian, who managed to publish a two volume book on, on Tajiks. Although we know that it was during the Soviet time and their approach was uh, somehow coordinated with Marxist sort of framework about the study of social science and uh, a little bit cautious because uh, modern Tajiks and uh, Tajikistan doesn't represent the, the whole Tajiks, but also you have to be very careful because uh, most of the time we do refer to uh, Samarkand and Bukhara as a, as a reference point, being cultural center or uh, capital of uh, Samarit to give you from modern perspective to the Tajik history. And then we have, of course, Edmund Bosworth, who was another English historian, orientalist, and specialized in Iranian studies and Arab, Arabist, uh, who is also well known for being a scholar of Turkic uh, people. But of course, looking at the sort of modern Central Asia and a lot of references of cultural dominance of Iranian people, Iranian people, I would say maybe that's uh, probably easy. And uh, a few years ago, <coughs> Frederick Richard also lost enlightenment. Quite, quite interesting. He doesn't specify. Sir, sorry, yeah. he doesn't specify who he is referring as a, as a let's say, a sedentary people. But you can guess um, it's a reference to Iranian people or what is known modern Tajiks. And then we have uh, Richard Fry, another great American scholar of Iranian and Central Asian studies, and. Uh, by the time of the sort of like uh, Gorbachev time and eventually the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
he got to know and uh, sort of probably more accessible to visit Central Asia and uh, was also teaching at the Tajik State University, very well known scholar and uh, whom you have dedicated the book actually. And, uh, and then, of course, the same range of these great scholars, I, I sort of, I, I see you and uh, what you have done so far. And uh, this is an uh, honor for us uh, to have you here and uh, talking. And most of these uh, people, apart from probably scholars who are more uh, focused on, um, on the regional studies and, and Central Asia, there is that representative of the Tajik community in the United Kingdom. And I would like to just uh, start with a few questions before I open the floor for our audience. And uh, one of the one of the questions <coughs> I would like just to ask, actually, it's just uh, quite interesting. Although you have been talking about this sort of like giving a bigger picture for us, but it would be very interesting to know. Uh, in the introduction of the book, obviously, you have mentioned <coughs> certain, certain points here, but why Tajik? What was the motivation behind it? Why, why, why you just focus on a particular community of people? And well, it was a story that needed to be told. Um, and as I mentioned in the preface, uh, when I was a graduate student, um, uh, uh, um, I was uh, uh, aware of what Professor Fry was, was doing in, in going to Tajikistan, and he is saying that he had in mind to write a history of the Tajiks, and he started writing it while he was living in, in Tajikistan. And, but in the end, as is often the case, uh, our creative work takes on a life of its own, and the book that came out was not, in fact, the book that he intended to write. It was called A Heritage of Central Asia, and it's not a history of the Tajiks. Um, so, um, when I read that book, I thought, well, that book still hasn't been written. And 20 years later, it still hadn't been written. Um, uh, this was around the time that um, uh, I had written a book uh, called Iran and World History, where I attempted to demonstrate the, the broad and lasting influence of Iranian culture all over the world, from the Balkans to China, um, is something that people often are not aware of. And it was part of a series for Oxford University Press. And uh, it originally included uh, uh, Central Asia, Afghanistan. and, and uh, But it, it, in the series, they had word limits. Uh, and they said, your book is too long. We have to cut stuff out. So they said, well, you know what? We're going to cut out all the stuff about Central Asia and Afghanistan, because the book is Iran and world in world history. And, <clears throat> And so we just wanted it to be about Iran. And so I was very frustrated by that. And I thought, OK, I guess i got to write another book to tell the other half of the story. Because in the end, Iran and world history turned out to be a book about Western Iran. And, uh, and for me, that's only half the story, because the other half is Eastern Iran. So the subtitle of the book, of course, is Iranians of the East. So in my mind, that's the definition of Tajik. Tajiks are the Iranians of the East. And it's the story of Iranian history that doesn't get told. You know, when we talk about Iranian history, we talk about the Persian Empire, we talk about the Sasanian Empire. There, to date, is not a single book about the Samanids. Why? Um, you know, the Samanids gave us new Persian. They gave us new Persian literature. So, um, you know, they gave us the Shahnameh in the sense. You know, I mean, they, they commissioned it. So, um, uh, uh, I think that there was a really crying need uh, for, for, for a book like this. And I, I'm sure it won't be the last, but I, if it gets the discussion going and if people come and say, oh, Fultz, you, know, you didn't say enough about this, well, go ahead, you know, write, write your own book and, and add to it because this is just a start. Um, but I'm very happy to um, have had the privilege of, of, uh, of getting, the, getting the discussion going. Well, uh, thank you. And just at this point, I would like to just say a few words related to what you just mentioned. Prior to Richard Fry, in Western scholarship, Tajiks were somehow lost in the shadow of Iranian studies. When the focus turned to post-Soviet Central Asia again, the Tajik study was lost in, in background of Turkic studies. It's unfair and ironic, since every material and textual evidence suggest that in the presence of the or a father of Tajiks in Central Asia and Eastern Central Asia predated all the Turkic-speaking people in the region. 
as Richard Fry says, it was until 9th century, the emergence of Uyghur kingdom, there was no such a thing called Turkic culture in the region. So again, uh, the question which probably you would like to hear, of course you did mention it, and it's in your presentation, and you're just uh, starting the book in the introduction, but uh, just, let's say, in a very simple way, who are the Tajiks? Well, um, the, for the past thousand years, the history of Central Asia has been the story of a symbiotic relationship between two very different peoples. So just analogous to what I said about the relationship between the Sintashta Aryans and the BMAC, or Oxus peoples, the nomadic warriors uh, and the settled you know, in, in industrialists, uh, the, 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 the civilization, um, they created a symbiosis, and the result was Sogdian culture. In the same way, um, we have uh, uh, the, 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 the Turks and the Tajiks over the past thousand years have, been, have represented a continuation of that kind of symbiosis. The, 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 the Iranians ceased to be nomadic. They ceased to be the ones playing that role. Uh, you know, the Scythians, they got assimilated to Slavs and to... And, 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 to, and to Mongols and to Turks. Um, in Turkish culture, we see a lot of Iranian survivals from Scythian times. You know, a lot of these ancient traditions, because there were no Turks back then. The Turks came from further to the east. We don't see uh, 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 Turk-type physiology in skeletons until about 3,500 years ago, and then very slowly moving in and, and mixing with the Iranian peoples. So a lot of what is considered Turkic culture today, even the, the steppe culture, is probably borrowed from the earlier culture of the nomadic Iranian peoples. So that relationship goes back for about 3,000 years. But in the past 1,000 years, it's taken an Islamic shape. So Islamic civilization in Central Asia for the past 1,000 years has been a Perso-Islamic civilization, that is to say it's been an Iranian form of Islam um, that has been promoted, perhaps ironically, by Turks. Because for most of those thousand years, Turks have run the government. But Turks have promoted culture by promoting Iranian culture. They never promoted Turkic culture because the Turks were not recognized as having the culture, as you, as you, as you suggested uh, yourself. And of course, nowadays we'd say, of course, nomads have a culture. But in the, in the thinking of the times, in order to show yourself to be civilized, being civilized meant speaking Persian, knowing Persian poetry, wearing Persian clothes, eating Persian food, and incidentally, marrying Persian <laughs> women. You know, Mahmoud of Ghazna was half Tajik. His mother was a, was, a, was a Tajik. We don't hear that, you know? He was a Turk, you know? No, he was 50% Tajik, and he was culturally thoroughly Persianized. He was the great promoter of Persian poetry. He didn't promote anything Turkish except uh, fighting techniques, because that's what the Turks were good at. That's what they were admired for. So you have administration and war, you know, uh, and then you have the bureaucracy and uh, the, the written culture. And this was, this was actually formalized in the Central Asian governments. They had a, a Divani Amiran, which was the Turks, you know, running the you know, uh, political and military uh, uh, side of things. And then you had the Divani Tajikan, which was the bureaucracy and the literary classes uh, that uh, uh, dealt with court ceremony and diplomacy and everything else. So it's a symbiosis. You can't have one without the other. In my book, Iran and World History, I have a chapter called The Turks, Champions of Persian Civilization. Because if we look at the last thousand years, and we look at the spread of the Persian language into India, into Turkey, into you know, uh, China, it wasn't spread by Iranians, it was spread by Turks. And the, so the Turks were not spreading their own culture, they were, they were spreading Tajik culture, Iranian culture. Um, so I think that, you know, although sometimes, you know, Iranians look down on Turks, but they owe them quite a lot. Um, <laughs> because the Iranians lost the political power to be able to promote their own culture. The Turks were promoting it for them. But this is not unique, you know. I mean, once the Goths 
sacked Rome in the fifth century, put in, you know, they became the great champions of Latin culture. They became, you know, they started wearing togas and eating grapes and, you know, um, and, 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 and reciting Virgil, you know? I mean, that, so, so, you know, the Holy Roman Emperor was a German, right? So that's, that's, that's how it always works. It's, not, it's nothing unique in history. Just uh, one last question before I open up the floor for that. Wonderful audience. And uh, it's, again, it's in the same sort of uh, way as you have been speaking. Uh, let's say, since they have been such a great sort of tajikor, their predecessors played such an important role in, as a cultural edge who spread this uh, sort of... Uh, civilization all over the regions or passing India to Central Asia and later on to China, Buddhism you just mentioned. And uh, But from what we, as a Tajik, we see and uh, many other scholars would argue, Samanid was considered as a, as a sort of like a Tajik Renaissance or Persian Renaissance and modern Persian language sort of flourished in, in, in Bukhara and uh, Bach. But why, why ever since they were like this was considered as, as a last sort of first and last sort of empire? It was there was one later. The Gurids were Tajiks, right? Um, and the Gurids ruled northern India for, 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 for a century or so, and and uh, parts of what's now Afghanistan and uh, and, and, and Iran for, for, for longer than that. Um, the, the Gurids, I think, can be considered a Tajik dynasty, and they were after the Samanids, but. Well, the reality is that the Iranians, you might say they lost the will to fight, you know, they, they prefer to, you know, to, to, to just, uh, you know, enjoy the finer things in life than to go out into the battlefield and, you know, and face those hardships. So they let the Turks do it, do it for them. You know, that, I mean, this began already in the Sogdian times. The Sogdians were already hiring, uh, they, the Sogdians totally were dependent on Turks for their military. I mean, the, the Sogdians never really had a state. They were under the protection of the Turks. It was the Turks that protected them from the Chinese. It was the Turks that protected them from the Sasanians. You know, the Sogdians had better relations with the Turks than they did with the Sasanians, who were their, their Iranian neighbors. And if the Sogdians were able, the Sogdian merchants were able to trade silk from Byzantium to China, it's because they had Turkic uh, military escorts that, that made sure that they stayed safe. You know? So this, this relationship between the, you know, the, the, the Iranians and the Turks in, in, in Central Asia, it's, it's one of mutual dependency, and it's mutually beneficial. And it's really, really sad that since the Soviet period, it's been turned into an antagonism. It's really unfortunate, because that's not the historical reality. I mean, up until 1920, the urban dwellers of Central Asia, of Samarkand, Bukhara, Khojan, they were called Sarts. Sart is not a linguistic designation. And in reality, Sarts were all perfectly bilingual in, in Persian and Turkish. Perfectly bilingual. They could easily switch uh, back and forth. Culturally, they were Persian because they, they recited Persian literature and they, they, they did the bureaucracy in Persian and, and, they, and they had Persian customs and so on and so forth. Um, but they could speak uh, Turkish with perfect uh, fluency. Um, and and uh, and that interestingly, that word Sart simply was omitted from the Soviet censuses from the beginning. They just they decided let's get rid of that because the Soviets wanted to create nations based on languages. It was it was their ideology. It was Stalin that thought this up in about 1915? And uh, another so, sorry, another Aryan. Yes, <laughs> an Ossetian. Yes, although he never admitted it. He promoted, didn't promote himself that way, and he wasn't even very proud of it. Anyway, um, but the point is that um, that uh, these were constructed identities. The Bolshevik, uh, what, what we have, the, the nation states we have in Central Asia today, they're completely fabricated according to uh, Bolshevik ideology. They don't have any basis in, or very little basis in historical reality. So there's a dramatic... Uh, um, uh, Re, uh, refashioning of identity in Central Asia that takes place in the 1920s, and the Tajiks are the catastrophic losers in this. In, in this they, the Tajiks really lost out. I mean, you get people like Kyrgyz that never existed before. There was no such thing as Kyrgyz. I mean, there was the word Kyrgyz, but it didn't mean them. You know, 
And, and, and uh, you know, there was no Kyrgyz language, there was no Kazakh language, there was no Azeri language. In fact, the Azeri language was originally uh, Northwestern Iranian. It was probably descended from the, you know, it's not until the 17th century that Azerbaijan becomes Turkified. So, um, so yes, this was, this was a purely political uh, phenomenon, um, but which has lasting effects right up to the present day. Well, thank you very much, and now the floor is uh, sort of uh, open for our wonderful people here who have a question. And also just something, because since the majority of them are Persian speakers, and uh, you can even ask your question in Persian, I think. <laughs> Please, yes, go ahead. <coughs> That's a whole one-hour lecture. <laughs> I know that the, yeah, I have time. I know the Turks usually refer to the Iran, which is for you. And uh, but you know, I also read somewhere that the word comes from the Ch Chinese, who just refer to a group of people, the Iranian people. Is that true? Well, there are lots of um, theories about the origin of the word Tajik. And all of them are wrong, except one. <laughs> um, the, 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 the correct uh, theory is that it was a term that arose in the Sasanian period in Iran. It was a derogatory term you applied to Arabs. And it comes from the term Thai, which was an Arab tribe. So it was, uh, you know, it was a kind of insulting uh, term. Um, uh, and then later on, when the Arabs attacked Iran and conquered it, those Iranians who refused to convert to Islam continued to use it in this negative way, and they, they, it also applied to Iranians who converted to Islam. So it was like saying, well, you've gone Turk, you've gone Saracen, you know, you've gone, you know, you've gone over to the enemy, right? And then as the Muslim armies moved into Central Asia in the, in the 8th century, of course, the Sogdians saw these, you know, foreign invaders, um, and 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 they adopted this term uh, for for Muslims in general because they were the attackers. The attackers were Muslim, and it happened that by the early eighth century, most of the soldiers in the Muslim army were Iranians, and they would be speaking Persian, not Arabic. So um, uh, then, um, uh, uh, by the Samanid period, of course, the major rivals of the Muslims and the Samanids were, of course, an Islamic empire, um, were the Turks to the north. And so the Turks uh, used the term for all their Muslim enemies because the Turks were pagans. And of course, once the, the, the Turks converted to Islam, the Turks could no longer use Tajik as a pejorative term for all Muslims. It just meant Persian speakers. Then it was a pejorative term for people who aren't Turks because the, the Turks were also Muslim. So it lost its religious meaning and just came to have a, a more linguistic and sociological meaning. And then in 1920, it got reinvented once again. But that's a whole story. But it's all in the book. So, <laughs> If I could just yeah, add a bit sure. to that. You the, um, <laughs> it's got an anecdote about the, the, word, the meaning of Tajik. An Armenian friend of, of mine told me that in Armenia, they would call Azerbaijanis, um, from the Republic of Azerbaijan, Turkic speakers now, obviously Iranian descent, Tajik, mm -hmm. yeah. which simply meant um, Muslim. But the Armenians borrowed the word already in pre-Islamic yeah. times. Tajik yeah. exists in Armenian from, from the Sasanian <coughs> period. Probably that got carried over. Um, if I may ask a question before. Um, you, you mentioned the word Aryan, obviously, mm -hmm. and you, you mentioned that you know, it meant sort of noble, which is attested, attested meaning in Sanskrit as well. Um, would you say it's more, it was more of, um, to the people who called themselves Aryan, um, obviously we only, in history, we only hear from the ruling class voice, we don't really hear, hear from sort of lower classes. Would you say it was more likely to be a class designation or an ethnic designation? Well, I don't think it's a class designation because we know the class designations. Right. You know, there are designations for the priestly caste. There are designations for the warrior caste, yeah. and there are designations for the producer uh, caste, the herders and, yeah, yeah, and, and, and craftsmen. So I don't think we need another term for any one of those castes. I think it makes more sense to see it as a as a general term, us versus them. I see. A group designation. I see. Yes. Thank you. 
Yeah. And in fact, um, historical linguists have reconstructed a term that goes back maybe 6,000 years, which was herios, oh, herios, which they say meant a member of our group. Yeah. And so probably the, 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 the acquisition of the notion of noble came later on. In other words, our group is noble, as opposed to all the other groups. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, but uh, so all of course, uh, uh, Well, yes, this is the point, is that um, this is one of the transformation, this is one of the stages, his question is how is it that uh, most of the Tajiks now live in the mountains? Um, uh, the, 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 this is one of the stages of the semantic transformation of the word Tajik. By the 19th century, probably even the late 18th century, the word Tajik was being used um, to distinguish mountain dwellers as opposed to city dwellers. The city dwellers were called Sarts, and they were bilingual. Mountain dwellers, who were mostly not bilingual, who mostly just spoke Iranian languages, um, were then referred to as Tajik, somewhat pejoratively, I think, um, by city dwellers. So again, it's a new transformation in the meaning of the word. So that, for example, we have uh, the Emir of Bukhara, we have at a certain stage, he's um, constituting a special battalion uh, uh, in his army, and he calls it the Tajik Battalion. And these are soldiers that are from Badakhshan. And he starts using them because they have no tribal loyalties to anybody close to the Bukhara court, and that he he thinks they'll be easier to control. Special yeah, special forces. Yeah. So the the the, the, the Tajik battalion uh, in the 19th century referred to these mountain <coughs> dwellers who actually were not Persian speakers; they were Shogni speakers or Roshni or or Wahi, you know. Um, and this is this is perhaps the dominant usage of the term Tajik at the beginning of the 20th century. And this, I think, helps explain why there were, were no Tajik nationalists at the table when they're carving up nations, you know, because, in fact, the, the intellectuals uh, and the politicians in Central Asia who were active uh, Bolsheviks drawing up this, these new states, they were mostly what we would call Tajik. They were from, you know, Persian-speaking, you know, uh, urban backgrounds. You know, you know Faisal Khojaya, for example. These people. They, we, 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 we would probably label them Tajiks. But they had a choice because they were inventing these new nations, these new identities, and they're saying who's going to do what, right? And and who gets what? So these people, we have to recall that the Tajik, what, the Tajik culture was associated with the institutions, the religious institutions, the waqfs, the madrasas, the bureaucracy, the, the royal courts. All of these things were what the Bolsheviks were trying to get rid of. So when the Bolsheviks were promoting a, a, a modernist program of changing society, getting rid of the old, what there was to get rid of was basically what we call Tajik culture. Okay? Um, Whereas, by contrast, from the 19th century onwards, it, throughout the Muslim world, modernism was associated with Turkic speakers. You know, Ismail Gesprinsky, the, tar, the Tatar in the Russian Empire, uh, uh, Constantinople, or Istanbul, was the, was the center of Islamic modernism. You know, even uh, Jalal uh, was, you know, based for a long time in, in, in Istanbul. So this was a Turkic-speaking environment. So this, this sort of pan-Islamic modernism was expressing itself through Turkish newspapers and, and, and Turkish uh, po political tracts and so forth. Um, so modernism or Tur w was associated with Turkish. And, and, and the, the, the obsolete past was associated with Persian. 
right? So when it came time to create these identities and divide up nations, the people at the table, although we might consider them properly Tajiks, they chose Uzbek identity, which they created. There was no Uzbek identity like what they created. You know, there was no Uzbek nation. In fact, Uzbek was an insult uh, until they rehabilitated the term and made it into a nation. So Samar and they were mostly from Samarkand. They were mostly from Samarkand, and by definition, uh, Tajiki speakers, because even today, most people in Samarkand speak Tajik. Most people in the Uzbek government today are from Samarkand, which means they grew up speaking Tajiki. But to this day, there is this, you know, official oppression of, of, of Tajiki in Uzbekistan, which goes back to the legacy of the Bolsheviks, that, you know, Persian is associated with the obsolete institutions of the Islamic past. We're trying to build something new here, so let's build it on fresh ground. There are no Turkic institutions. There are no Turkic traditions that we have to get rid of. We can just make them all new. That's, you know, the best I can... Thank you. Um, <coughs> I have uh, several questions. Uh, solar symbolism is often associated with these um, Indo-Iranian tribes, but you have it everywhere. I mean, each Egyptian culture is replete with solar uh, symbolism, Mayan culture. In Mesopotamia, you have Shamash. Uh, isn't it a sort of more of a universal phenomenon that is specifically in the... Sun worship may be universal, but the way you do it um, is culture-specific. And I think that there are some uh, culturally specific solar myths and rituals that can be associated with the Aryan peoples. Well, there are, I also have two, three more points. May I make them? You, Probably two more, then. <laughs> you, you showed the image of the circular <coughs> fertility dance. If you had seen the... I don't know if it was a fertility dance. Or whatever. It, yeah. I think it probably is, because mm. there are similar ones that were excavated in the Southern Catholic, um, the Southern Catholic Coast. Mm -hmm. They were exhibited in the 7,000-year uh, uh, 7, year the Persian art exhibition that did the... Are they on rock? Are they rock inscriptions? No, no, on pottery. On pottery. On pottery, all around. It's <laughs> almost identical to that, mm. that one. And um, finally, I also wanted to ask you a practical question. You said that it's impossible to get to Panja Camp. I was there. No, I didn't. Did I say that? No, I didn't say that. No, oh, I didn't, didn't say, say that. that. No. Okay. <coughs> I, I, Probably Wahan. 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 It's not impossible well, to get to Wahan. It's difficult. You have to really want to get there. But you can. You can go. I, I think there is a thing organized at the end of October by the Ismailis, the conference on ancient Iran, and that it includes a. Uh, Will they take you into Wakhan? Because it's it's not that hard to get to Khoro, which is where the Ismaili Center is. And it's a gorgeous city. I very much recommend going there. The Ismaili Center is one of the most inspiring pieces of modern architecture I've ever seen. It's um, uh, uh, But Khorog is easy stuff compared to getting into the Wakhan. I mean, Khorog is high civilization compared to what's about, you know, 50 kilometers down the road. <laughs> but if you got a 4x4, four four, and they have 4x4s, four four, so if they're going to take you, then you'll, you'll be fine. More than... <laughs> Please go. Thanks. Uh, you, you mentioned the um, suppression of Dutch language and culture uh, between the Soviet period and in the drawing of the boundaries. Actually, it got worse after the Soviet well, period. Okay, yeah. yes. and, and in the drawing of the boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, what about China? Uh, I mean, when we were in <coughs> Xinjiang, Last year, uh, our local guy in Kashgar was an ethnic Tajik, mm -hmm. um, born and lived all his life in China, came from a community, uh, he said, near the Pakistani border, actually, mm -hmm. um, uh, speaking Tajik. Um, well, but uh, he said he had never seen his own language, Tajik, written down, because the Chinese mm -hmm. government does not allow it. Uh, and, and well, we crossed paths because I was I was I was there last year too, right. and I, I uh, it's it was absolutely horrifying. I've I've seen police states in my time. I visited <laughs> Romania under Ceausescu. Uh, I visited the Soviet Union twice. I've been to a lot of really you know troubled places. I've never seen anything like what I saw in Xinjiang last right. year. It is absolutely by far and away the worst police state I've ever seen. 
And the Tajiks are completely caught up in it because mm -hmm. it's a clampdown on Uyghurs, but it's really a clampdown on Muslims in general. Yeah. Anybody, all the Muslims, the Way Muslims, the Chinese Muslims are getting caught up in it too. There's at least a million people in concentration camps. The Tajiks really try to keep their heads down. You know, they're not, uh, they're not uh, getting involved in the uprisings the, the way the Uyghurs are. There's only 40, 50,000 of them. Yeah. They're, they're terrified. Um, yeah. And yes, there is no real recognition or encouragement of, the, of, of they don't speak Tajiki, they speak, uh, they speak either Wahi or um, uh, Sarikoli. Right. They, they're, 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 um, um, yeah. So they're Pamiri peoples. Right. Um, they're called Tajik in the way that I'm, I talked about started in the 19th century, referring to what we you know, sometimes call mountain Tajiks or the Pamiris, <laughs> which, you know, they speak Iranian languages, they're Iranian languages, but they're not Persian. Yeah. Um, uh, some of them know Persian, but I was trying really hard to find people who knew Persian poetry and stuff. And, and a lot of people that I met, they, they were really proud to be able to recite maybe one line of Hafez. And that was the extent of their knowledge of Persian. But it meant something to them. In other words, culturally, they identified with it. Um, so I think that's something. But no, I mean, the Chinese government uh, uh, does absolutely nothing to to allow them any breathing space at all. Although for tourist purposes, not that apart from you and I, I think they saw any tourists <laughs> last no. year. Um, they certainly don't make it easy. No. Um, but they put up signs in English saying things like, you know, like in the museums and stuff, and they say, and here's an exhibition devoted to the Tajiks, who are the only Caucasian nationality in China. I, we're so proud to have them, but they don't behave like they're proud to have them, and they certainly don't treat them very well. Well, this, this uh, guy had said that uh, who went away, he was at school, for instance, in this Tajik-speaking area, and um, at school they, they were only allowed to learn Mandarin and Uyghur, yeah. and so the teacher, who was also ethnic, Tajik, was <laughs> explaining Uyghur grammar to the local kids in Tajiki, yeah. <laughs> or in Tajik, probably, sorry, calling probably, yeah. yeah. But also, also the government of China is very hostile to any links between the Tajiks in China mm -hmm. and well, especially along the border, because they're exactly the same people. I mean, in the north, there's Sarikalis on both sides of the border, and in the south, there are they're, 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 they're Wahis on, on both sides of the border. So, um, and I, yeah, the Chinese, uh, would, you know, they, they've been very resist, risk, resistant about, um, you know, allowing any movement. They've also been stealing territory, or, or, or uh, you know, uh, forcing the Tajiks to give up territory. Because of well, yeah, because it's all this Belt and Road thing, you know, and they, and they gave $2 billion to the Tajik government a few years ago, and the Tajiks um, uh, built a new parliament building. It looks like a crashed spaceship. And I, I, I suppose that a new parliament building is a more pressing need than schools and hospitals and roads, but, um, but they couldn't pay back the, 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 the interest payments, and so the Chinese said, okay, you know, we're just going to take, like, you know, 700,000 hectares of your territory and add them to China. So they redrew the border. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future with this Belt and Road. Mm. So we can take a few questions on the side because it's just all. Yeah, we'll come back. Okay, sure. Let's go. <coughs> Two questions. One, uh, uh, can we trace uh, Tajik ethnicity or Tajik culture in Western civilization? And the other one, uh, uh, in regards to your comment that <coughs> the Turks promote the uh, Persian language in, in, in India for a few centuries. <coughs> Do they have any alternative so that they could promote their own culture or their own For the Turks? The Turks. Why they promote the Persian instead of well, first, in terms of you know your question, the first part of your question, whether Tajik culture was influential in the world, I don't. Again, as I said at the very beginning, I don't make any distinction between Tajik culture and Persian culture. They're one and the same. You know, the Tajiks are Eastern Iranians, Persians are Western Iranians, but it's the same language, the same civilization. Um, uh, so, in that sense, Persian civilization is one of the most influential civilizations ever. I just read uh, a very interesting article uh, by Brian Spooner, a professor of Persian, retired from the University of Pennsylvania, a 25-page article 
where he makes the case that Persian is one of the five most influential languages in history. And even I was a little bit thought, well, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it's a very interesting article because he really makes the case, mustering a lot of evidence. What constitutes an influential language? And yeah, he's got a strong case that Persian, just the language, is, has been hugely influential throughout history. And if you, if you know anything about um, you know, uh, the history of the British Raj or even the English language, you know there's a dictionary, Hobson Jobson, it's a big fat thing, which is all Persian words that found their way into English you know, during the time of the British Raj, because Persian was the uh, official language. And that's why you have you know, a chair of Persian studies at Oxford and at Cambridge, because you know, in the, up until 1837, if you wanted to get a job in the British civil service um, uh, you know, to, be sent, uh, to be sent to India, you first had to learn Persian, because that was the official administrative language of the British Raj in India, because they just took over what the Mughals did. And the Mughals were Turks, but their administrative language was Persian. And I read somewhere that there's 10 times more Persian literature in total that has been produced in India than was produced in Iran. And that, that's not surprising because, because India is a big place and, and Persian was the official language for 800 years. So it wasn't a native language, but you know, um, I mean, you know, uh, Portuguese is not native to Brazil, but you know, Brazilians <coughs> produce a lot more literature than Portugal does. So, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's that kind of thing. Yeah, well, yeah, also, uh, just, just something to add in it, uh, probably you have seen it, but maybe you disagree, I, in, in like, uh, the recent publication, I actually tried to call it what is the present Iran, Western area, and what is, like, the yeah, course of Central Asia, Eastern area, is a new sort of uh, map I, I tried to work out, and uh, the editor of the book um, is a very close friend, and he's an English man, and he said that I tried to Google, but I couldn't find Eastern and Western area. I said, I'm just trying to make this map. He said, you're not in English to make this map. This is our job, not yours. But anyway. <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah, my name is Arjun Alahar. I'm a project as well from uh, Afghanistan. My question is about, um, as Mr. Belli also said, that making the, you know, divide and rule and unfortunately, uh, you know, provided by the British to, to do that, and also um, nowadays you you said in your book that the, the Tajiks are actually the Eastern Iranians, but unfortunately in Afghanistan the Tajiks are suppressed not to call themselves nor Tajik nor Iranian, but they are um, um, forced to call themselves Afghan. Um, and um, as you said, <laughs> it was the Tajiks who made the terminology of Uzbek, which actually mm -hmm. they made another. But now they are they are forced not to call themselves Tajik, not to um, practice their culture, not to practice the civilizations that they have uh, been, you know, uh, given to the other world, uh, other people like the Turks and so on. Uh, that's my question. How do you see the future of Tajik, especially in Afghanistan and also in uh, China, and also the awakening of Tajiks in Pakistan now, where they were uh, called Patans for hundreds of years until they found. The, uh, the birth certificate of their forefathers, and there was clearly written that they were not Pakhan, which is another name for Pashtun and Afghan, but the Tajiks. So how do you see this uprise of the Tajikism or the Tajiks uh, in the Central Asia? Um, also, um, uh, the hatred of the name Iran uh, among uh, those places like Afghanistan. So for example, I'm, I'm a Tajik and I'm proud to, to say that I'm a Persian and Iranian, but if I say this in my country, they will see see me as a traitor, as someone who is going to be the spy of an Iran. Because if I call myself an Iranian, I'm not an Afghan, so it means that I'm the enemy of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the, this political thing as you have uh, done all this research? And also one more remark about that uh, assumption that you made about those two people having anal sex. How do you know that those two were men? No, I don't. <laughs> how do you know? And how do you know that that was anal six? That could have been another way of the newly formed yeah. Kama Sutra. Yeah. That it was they were they were doing it more a doggy yeah. style or whatever, yeah. rather than having yeah. a because it, it, makes be doggy style. <laughs> it makes me very uncomfortable to know that anal six has come 
<laughs> from my ancestors, but I know that my grandfather. I'm sure they weren't the like... only ones doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to add a little bit of, uh, you know, assist on the fact. But my question is, how do you see now the projects are more, you know, awakened, and now they know that they are projects and Persians and Iranians and not the other name that they have been called now, which have been given by the British. Uh, well, first I have to say that one of the great regrets in my life is that so far I've never had the, the pleasure of visiting Afghanistan. I missed my chance back in 1978 when I was hitchhiking from Paris to Nice as a teenager and uh, got kicked up by two hippies in a Citroën de Cheval and, and they said, uh, said uh, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Nice. They said, we're going to Afghanistan. we got room. Don't you want to come? And I said, nah, just get off in Nice. And, and I, I, I've never been able to live that down to this day. Uh, I missed my chance. And, yeah. And um, so I can't speak with any authority on the situation in Afghanistan. I have Afghan friends, I, I, you know, I, I read what I can, I listen to what I can, but I really don't know what the situation is in Afghanistan and I can't say. As a historian, of course, I'm aware that there's no such thing as Afghanistan until 1747 when Ahmad Durrani, uh, who was a, uh, a, you know, a, a soldier uh, in, in, the, in the Iranian army, um, uh, uh, took advantage of the fact that Nader Shah uh, went nuts and, uh, you know, like other uh, generals in the army, decided to carve out his own little fiefdom, which turned out to be a pretty big fiefdom. And, and, and because he was a Pukhdan, um, who at the time were called uh, Afghans or Alvan, um, but that was an insult too, because it goes back to Sasanian times. Alvan in Sasanian times referred to people who, when they try to speak, it comes out sounding like Al. And the, and the al on is the plural, of course, so uh, uh, Afghan is, is the al sayers. <laughs> um, and it's exactly like we see in so many, I mean, uh, uh, ajam, the, the uh, uh, Arabic word for Persian, it means people who don't know how to speak. You know, Niemetz, uh, uh, the Slavic word for German, it means they who can't speak. So this is always the kind of insult that you give to your neighbors, right? So the point is that didn't become an ethnicity. Um, uh, until, well, it didn't become a nation until 1747, which in the history of Iranians is, is yesterday. I mean, it's pretty, pretty recent. And even, you know, Samarkand and Bukhara were part of Nader Shah's empire. So, you know, we're talking about the mid-18th century. It's very, very much modern times that the Iranian world was unified. Okay, so it's, it's not hard to, to stretch back. And the things that you're talking about, this divide and conquer thing, this is all part of modern history. Can it be undone? Should it be undone? I, I don't know. I mean, this is the point. I mean, the, the, the entire Iranian world is in a bit of a mess. And, um, you know, uh, uh, would uh, 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 Tajiks uh, in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan and Afghanistan be better off if they lived in the same, under the same government as Iranians? I don't think many of them want to live under this Iranian government, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, but I mean, <laughs> there's no model. There's no attractive model for Iranian people now um, uh, in terms of having, you know, uh, a, a country that that represents their cultural uh, unity. So I'm not very optimistic in that sense. I don't see how that's going to happen. But I do think that with education, and that's why we write books and give talks. You know, it's uh, it's all about you know getting information out there. Is that you know, of course, people become aware of. The, the, the very rich connections they have with others, then of course they, they, that, that gives them, that empowers them, right? Uh, so I, I hope to see all the Iranian peoples increasingly empowered through a greater awareness and appreciation of their great cultural contributions throughout history. No. <laughs> Less said the better. I did say that we can only speculate on what yeah, these things mean. Right. We have no idea. Yes. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate a little bit more on, um, as many scholars have a chance with these kind of terminologies, the choice of using Iranians rather than Persians here. Iranian is a broader term. Iranian refers to all the speakers of Iranian languages. Persian is one of the Iranian languages, therefore Persians are refers Persian refers to the people who speak that particular Iranian language, which is a Iranian language of the Southwest. 
which during the 8th and 9th and 10th centuries spread into Central Asia. So Tajiki is Persian, you know, because the native language, the original language of the Iranians of Central Asia was Sogdian, or in the Pamirs, the, the, the various Pamiri languages. Okay, so they gave up Sogdian, which is a related language. It's the same thing that the, you know, that the, that the, that the people in Mesopotamia and Syria, you know, they, they spoke Aramaic. It was close to Arabic. And with the coming of Islam, most of them gave up speaking Aramaic and switched to Arabic, which wasn't too hard because it's a similar language, you know. Um, there are still Aramaic speakers today. It's usually the Christians and Jews that are Aramaic speakers. Um, uh, enough of them that Mel Gibson could do an entire film, The Last Passion of Christ, using native Aramaic speakers for the entire dialogue. And in Tajikistan today, there are people who speak a dialect of, of Sogdian. They, they call it Yagnavi. Um, uh, but yes, Persian is a more limited uh, term. It's the language of Pars or Parsa or Fars. Uh, and Iranian is all of these languages and cultures that are spread from, you know, Ossetia all the way to China. Well, uh, since we have like five more minutes, but uh, here we have another uh, friend and uh, someone who really very hard worked next to us to organize this event, uh, Mr. Karim Karim, and he has to say a few words and would like to give five minutes for him. I will go straight to practical stuff. Uh, first of all, on behalf of our community, Tajik of Afghanistan, and we have an uh, association here for the Colonial Program Z Project Corps for Tisa Bonum. As we have to solve with the problem that we are Tajik of Afghanistan, so we do not know that to solve that problem, we say that the association of Tajik and Afghanistan uh, would like to express our deepest gratitude. Uh, for this wonderful job that you did. Again, it is a big issue of the collapse of communism in Afghanistan. We always joke that, that during the communism, we were talking about internationalism. The internet is going to have nationalism just now. In Afghanistan, we, uh, in the last few years, in the last 18 years, they tried to talk to uh, them with the free of national ID card. And that national ID card hasn't been issued despite all this pressure because Afghanistan and if they don't want to be called Afghan, so the, the identity issue is a big issue in Afghanistan. In Udan, and and always it's interesting to see uh, what in Afghanistan, especially our distinguished writers, some of them were here, they've done a great job, but it's always interesting to see from a perspective of an outsider what he thinks about, uh, and especially an academic person who done research in a sense, in all shows based on facts about our identity. This is why this is uh, uh, before Dr. Um, Zaydi asked me to uh, advertise and to have a, our website and Facebook, and I said, that, Have you read the book? And he said that, Well, um, what can I say? He said that uh, probably after Ferdowsi, this is Shahnami Ferdowsi, what I would call it now, this book with Dr. Richard Fold, other uh, Shahnami for the Seal of 2019. That's good enough. That's what we just do. That's the show. Just to go on practical stuff, I have three things to say. Uh, first of all, as you said, that you haven't been to Afghanistan. I've looked at it. I've, I've, I've been up and down the, 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 the border, of, uh, all the way from uh, uh, from the Uzbek side all the way to the China, uh, and I've looked at it, and I've waved at little kids playing soccer, and you know, women hanging their laundry, and you know, men cultivating their fields. Said hi, but haven't set foot there. Well, I need mean, to look at uh, the give. A few Tajik, he hasn't been to Afghanistan either. He hasn't seen Bala, he hasn't seen Bukhara, he hasn't seen Kabul, he hasn't seen Panjshir Valley. So we have a good news. Uh, the book uh, created a huge excitement in Afghanistan. Everyone wanted PDF of this book because uh, uh, just one year before, one of some of our, a group of our academics, they wrote a book about Afghanistan, Tajik's identity. 
their history in Afghanistan, and I'm happy that some of them are here that will come to that. And then your book comes so this issue, and many people want to you to be there in Afghanistan, and luckily uh, one of our what, grand institutions called the Afghanistan Institute of Strategic Studies, they invited you and Dr. Tadipola uh, to come for a series of lectures in Afghanistan, uh, all inclusive. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, That's great. That is the book. So yeah. you will see that. Yeah, we have it. We have it already. Oh, we have it. We have it. That's what you have. And uh, yeah, so, serious <laughs> indeed. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, in our culture, those who done the service for us, you have to give us presents as well. And when you do research in that area, that 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 region, Central Asia, you always come across two things. Self and Latin, Latin mm -hmm. and even for me it was quite <coughs> exciting when I went to Cairo Museum and the Pharaohs. And if you see their jewelry, they always have Latin Lazuli. And Latin Lazuli, Lazuli is only be found in the Badakhshan of Afghanistan or Pakistan. And that area, imagine that the, the trend in those days existed, the Sufi and the, 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 the course of business that they were doing that Latin Lazuli, from Badakhshan Mountain, the Jews, so that quite difficult even now to get in those days for getting all the way to, to Egyptian to Pharaoh, those who consider themselves God. Uh, uh, from in our community we have a group of businessmen as well and we talked about it. And one of them said uh, I would be honored to give one of those uh, a five piece of lap of Mizuri. so uh, it existed always in there, still there, and just to oh, remind everyone. Oh, you need everyone. to have God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, the, the lapis in Afghanistan for the last like, 50 years. It was illegal, legally exported to the government, but not that illegally it's been taken from Now we'd like to, uh, our, um, luckily we have it from Afghanistan Embassy, the press secretary, Mr. Uh, Aslami. Bokhatan Aslami, who's a few Tajik as well. Thank you to present to you. Basir Mohammadi, he's a stone merchant, and same as he followed our ancestor Sufyan way, way of living. And I thank uh, uh, Mr. Shahpur, which is a real Persian name, I think. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Shah, Shahpur, and he, as, as you know, probably the number, we see a lot of uh, people today couldn't attend because of the Ramadan, they might have been fasting, but he provided some uh, iftaria, what we call it. So at the end, you don't have. And uh, hopefully we will see you in Afghanistan. Uh, <laughs>